right, everyone. Welcome to the Pacific Marine Mammal Center. We're just going to wait a few minutes for um, some people to join us here. We're going to do a special patient update about Bolt, the entangled sea lion that was rescued um, a little bit over two weeks ago. We're also going to have um, two of our veterinarians join us today and tell you exactly how Bolt came to us today. So here he is hanging out in the pool. Alrighty, looking pretty good. But we'll just give it a few minutes and let some more people join us and then we will get started. Right now, Bolt is one of uh, nine other patients that we have here at Pacific Marine Mammal Center. We got four California sea lions and six northern elephant seals. So here's Bolt right now, but what we're going to do is we're actually going to go talk to some of our vets. So we're going to go into our barn here and tell you all a little bit about how Bolt first came to Pacific Marine Mammal Center. All right. Hi team. How's it going? Hi everybody, welcome back to the Pacific Marine Mammal Center. I'm Dr. Deming and we're gonna do an Instagram live with you, introduce you to some of our patients. You should have just met Balt outside really quick. So we're gonna go over a few things, but before we start talking about Balt's case, I wanna introduce you to somebody pretty special. Um, this is Dr. Kaylee Brown. Um, she is our new veterinary intern. So we have started a new training program to help impact our outreach um, as far as being outside of the Pacific Marine Mammal Center. So we started this internship program to allow us to start training veterinarians. So Dr. Kaylee is already a veterinarian um, in how to do conservation medicine, marine mammal medicine, and research. So I'll let Dr. Brown introduce herself a little bit and then we'll start talking about faults. Hi, I'm Dr. Kaylee Brown. Um, I went to the University of Florida for undergraduate and veterinary school, so go Gators. <laughs> um, and then I did complete um, a small animal rotating internship and um, an aquatic animal specialty internship, and now I am working to focus on conservation, marine mammal medicine, like Dr. Deming mentioned. Um, so I'm excited to join the team. And, all of our Welcome, Dr. Brown. Awesome. <laughs> so we're really excited to have Dr. Brown. Now we have three veterinarians on staff, which is awesome. You guys met Dr. Vanessa Ford during our last Insta Live when we talked about demoic acid. Um, Dr. Brown has had a really good start. Uh, she started back in July, and pretty much right when she got started, um, Bolt was put onto our radar. Um, so this is just a picture of Vault. Um, actually, Dr. Brown, myself, and Christine Fontaine, our necropsy biologist, went out for a paddleboard on July 18th in Dana Point, and we spotted Vault. Um, but we had known about Vault for some time prior to that. So for those of you guys who are familiar with animals that have been entangled that we've responded to in the past, you're aware of how challenging it could be to rescue these guys. Um, so this is an adult male California sea lion. You saw him already, but you can kind of tell how big he is compared to our traditional pup patients. So our pup patients come in and they weigh around 12 kilograms, so around 25 pounds on intake. Dr. Brown, how much did Bolt weigh when he came in? Bolt was 255 pounds when he came in. So believe it or not, 255 pounds is a little bit small for an adult male sea lion. So you can tell in this picture Bolt looks a little bit skinny. You can see that his shoulders are showing a little bit. You shouldn't see his shoulder blades like that. And then his back has this deep slope with not a lot of muscling along that. So Balt was first reported to us on April 24th by somebody that was paddleboarding around Dana Point Marina. And they recognized that he had that net entangled around his neck. At that point in time, it was only slightly embedded. He was in really good body condition. And we wanted to give him the chance to see if he could get that entanglement off on his own. One of the challenges when it comes to these animals that are entangled like this, especially these healthy adult male animals like he was back in April when he first got entangled, is it's hard to capture them. So it, we can't just walk up to Bolt when he's hanging out on a dock in Dana Point Marina and get a net on him very easily, especially without risking the safety of our rescue team. So we don't want Bolt to pull one of our rescuers into the water or potentially bite somebody. 
So what we did was we monitored him over time to see if he could shake this entanglement on his own. It's not very common that that happens, but they are really good at itching themselves on things like boat cleats um, or something out on the buoys. And sometimes they can catch that line and actually remove it on their own. Unfortunately, how many times was Vault reported to us since uh, then? Six times by the community, excluding wow. our paddleboard adventure. <laughs> yeah, so we just want to thank you guys for continuing to report him. So by having multiple reports of Vault, we were able to establish a pattern. Um, and that's one of the most important things to be able to do. Uh, to capture an animal like him safely, we have to use something called remote sedation, or a lot of you guys will think of tranquilizer guns um, for that. In order to tranquilize a marine mammal whose safe place is in the water, it can be life-threatening, basically. So we have to get approval from NOAA and National Marine Fisheries Service, who is the federal agency that oversees marine mammal health and safety. And we act under their permit to do remote sedation, and they evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis whether or not a marine mammal that is entangled has a life-threatening injury, and the risk-benefit analysis of attempting to remotely sedate that animal is worth the risk. So basically, if we use a dart gun to deploy a sedative um, into Balt's shoulder, which is the ideal place to be hitting him, he will hopefully go to sleep and then we can rescue him. Unfortunately, when they get startled like that and something hits them in the shoulder, they typically, their safe place is the water, so they'll typically take off and go into the water and then they be can become sedated in the water. So there is a risk of potential drowning. And that's why we have to assess a situation on an individual basis and make sure that the risk of potentially losing our patient um, that is entangled by sedating him is a necessary risk to take. So we put in the request to NOAA um, and gave them kind of our inaction plan of what our attempts was gonna be to rescue him. They reviewed his case and they concurred with us that this entanglement since April has progressively gotten worse. As you can see in this picture by July, the entanglement has significantly embedded into the right side of his neck. It looks a little bit infected, and more importantly, he has dropped a significant amount of weight between April and July. Thanks to um, the members of the public and Dana Point repeatedly reporting him, we are able to establish a pattern of behavior. So Vault would basically come into um, Dana Point Marina and hang out for anywhere from three to five days. And he did that a few times and we thought we had established a pattern of behavior and then he kind of disappeared on us for several months and we were a little confused we were a little bit nervous that he may have had a poor outcome or he may have, may have perished without us um, having the opportunity to help him um, but what we think was happening because he did end up returning obviously was he might have been hanging out um, over in the channel islands because the summertime is breeding time for these big boys and he is very interested in meeting some ladies so it's possible that he went kind of trolling for some ladies on San Miguel Island or somewhere in the Channel Islands during breeding season with his jewelry on his neck still. <laughs> and then by the time he made it back to Dana Point when breeding season was kind of wrapping up, he had really lost a significant amount of weight. Once we re-spotted him, we were obviously very excited, so we really appreciate you guys once again for calling him in and repeatedly calling him in so we can establish that pattern. Um, and then we felt, when we felt like we had a great opportunity to get out there at a time that he was there, um, we mounted a response. So um, before we talk about the response and how that all went, and before we go outside and meet little Balt, or big Balt, um, <laughs> I just want to point out what's around his neck. So you guys should be able to see this. Um, it kind of looks like fishing line, and it is. So it's monofilament line, and it's tied in squares. Does anyone know what that's called? If you guys know what that's called, put it down in the comment section. We'll see who knows um, <laughs> what it is, because it's something very similar that if you're a regular follower of ours, you've seen somewhat recently. So that's called gill net. Um, so he had gill net around his neck. Let's see if we can go to the next screen. And Dr. Kaylee is going to talk to you guys a little bit about what gill net is and how animals can get entrapped in it. Sure. So gill net is a, a large, like wide and deep netting that fishermen will use to um, capture a lot of different species of fish. Um, but uh, what it does is it can cause entanglements in lots of different species of turtles, sharks, whales, dolphins, and sea lions, um, other kind of heads. So um, basically the net, it can be miles wide and very deep. Um, and it's almost like a grid pattern. So it captures anything in its way, basically, as it sweeps on the floor. 
And the fishermen will deploy these nets obviously in areas of fish. Their goal is to help um, catch seafood that we all consume, right? That's the primary driver behind the use of these gill nets. Um, and unfortunately the sea lions, the whales, the dolphins all kind of go where the fish are too. So there is inevitably interactions between these fisher fisheries and our marine mammals. Um, so one of the things that we like to kind of point out is this is a known problem where there is an increased amount of marine mammal interactions with these gill nets. So if we could come up with some kind of innovative way to still have an effective way to capture fish that doesn't impact marine mammals, that would be something that could be a solution to this problem. So we'll talk about in the end some ways to eat some sustainable seafood and some things that we can do in the future to hopefully help these animals um, not get entangled in this gill net. I will say Loki and um, Balt are two of the lucky ones. We've had at least 12 individual animals reported that had unique entanglements like this. And Loki and Balt are the only two that had reliable patterns that enabled us to mount a response. So unfortunately, the logistics behind mounting a response to do it safely, both for people and for our patients, is quite challenging. We typically have anywhere from five to six boats that need to be on the water. We have to have drone operators. We have to have Harbor Patrol helping us, um, just kind of keeping us safe. And they also assist in the rescue process. We really appreciate Harbor Patrol's efforts in, in this. We couldn't have done it without them. Um, and the logistics to planning that is quite challenging. So when we were finally able to establish a pattern and predict that he was gonna be there one morning, we assembled our team. We had over 25 people out on the water in those five boats that we deployed. Um, and then one of our um, donors also volunteers a whole team of people that have now gotten really good at doing the drone operations for us and then assisting us um, with both a dinghy and their own boat that were really helpful support boats. So this is just an example of the morning that we went out. If you guys are familiar with Dana Point, you know that dock well. So that is Harbor Patrol's dock where the pump out station is right at the opening um, of Dana Point Marina. And the big boys, as you guys know, if you're familiar with that area, like to hang out on that dock, even though those buckets are trying to deter them, but they seem to figure out a way around them. Um, so that is little Bolt laying down exactly where he was when we um, did our remote sedation for him. That was the morning that we rescued him. So we were able to bring a boat up on the far side of that, safely deploy our dart um, into the area that's the quarantine yard for Harbor Patrol. So in case there was a misfire, for some reason we didn't deploy the dart into his shoulder and it missed him. Um, it would be in an area where there wasn't any concern for public safety and we definitely clear out that area behind him to make sure if I do miss him with the dart gun there's no issues with human safety. Once we deployed the dart he got his name because he popped up quickly and sprinted faster than Usain Bolt <laughs> off of that dock so we affectionately have nicknamed him Bolt and as you guys will see when we go take a look at him the front part of his neck has a scar that kind of looks like a lightning bolt so it's a very suiting name for little Bolt. Um, he, overall, he was a really good boy. He didn't take off completely. He actually headed to the bait barge, which is possibly his safe place, um, and was just hanging out in the water around the bait barge as the medications kicked in. So he became slowly sedated and did a really good job floating in the water that allowed our rescue team to go over and um, get nets on him and safely land him onto our rescue boat. For those of you that have seen our boat out there, we nickname it Blue. It says Pacific Marine Mammal Center Rescue on it, and that boat has seen some pretty cool action. Not only do we use it to disentangle or help rescue um, our pinnipeds or seals and sea lions that are entangled in nets, but it's our primary boat for large whale disentanglements. So one of the other things that we do is if there's an entangled large baleen whale, like a humpback whale, a gray whale, a fin whale entangled off of our coast, We'll deploy our rail disentanglement team under the direction and leadership of NOAA and Justin Bespecki, and we'll go out and try and help disentangle that whale. So Blue, our boat, when Krista posts um, a post of the darting, hopefully in the near future for you guys to see, you'll see Blue, and that boat's seen some pretty cool action. It really helps <laughs> some animals. Um, so. Once we remotely sedated him and were able to rescue him, I just kind of wanted to show you guys what it looks like when we do what's called our admission exam on him. He did probably aspirate a little bit of water on his rescue, so we gave him a break that day, and then the following day we anesthetized him. The entanglement that he had was um, not as complicated as Loki's, so we were able to actually remove the gill net um, on the boat when he was sedated during rescue. 
And then we wanted to anesthetize him, which is what you guys see here. That picture on the left, um, he had been administered another injection of sedatives. So we gave him an intermuscular injection of a few sedatives. And he's pretty sleepy right there, but not quite sleepy enough to safely handle him. So if can you guys recognize what that orange circular thing is that we're trying to put over his little muzzle? You guys can figure <laughs> out what that is. I'd love to see somebody take their best guess. One of my favorite things about aquatic and marine mammal medicine is you have to be creative. They actually do not make anesthesia masks for sea lions as big as him. So we've actually, along with a number of people within the marine mammal field, have determined that traffic cones make the best <laughs> anesthesia masks for these guys. So that's actually a traffic cone that's had the bottom cut off of it. Our maintenance guy, Mike, is really good at rigging stuff for us and Wayne, so shout out to them for, you know, entertaining our crazy <laughs> ideas of ways that we can help provide care for our patients. And then we just attach our anesthesia um, hose to that and the machine is right behind us. So once we're able to slip that over his face, it, it, it d delivers um, a inhalant anesthesia called isoflurane. It's the same kind of anesthesia they use in human medicine. And he slowly falls asleep. Once he's completely asleep, we're able to open up his mouth and intubate him. So on that picture on the right, you see that tube going into his mouth. That's actually what we call an endotracheal tube that is delivering both oxygen and inhalant anesthesia to him to keep him under anesthesia while we're collecting the samples we need and while we're assessing um, his wound and the level of involvement that that monofilament laceration had on his important underlying structures in his neck. So for those of you that remember Loki, Loki had a severed tongue, so that entanglement cut so deeply into Loki's neck that it actually caused a hole from the outside of his neck into the back of his mouth. Luckily, we got Balt before that degree of injury had taken place. So although Balt's injury looks pretty bad, and I'll show you in this next picture, if I can figure out the right mouse. Um, it, on the ventral aspect where a lot of the important structures are, it actually didn't embed too deep. And all of that pink that you see in his cool lightning bolt scar um, is actually just muscle. So just like Loki's lower wound, um, that can actually heal quite well on its own. And it didn't require any surgical intervention to correct because there was no defect in his trachea, in his larynx, or in his esophagus. So although we did anesthetize Loki to kind of do it, or sorry, Bolt to do um, an assessment of his wound to get those cute little flipper tags onto him um, and to just do a general health assessment in him. We didn't have to do any um, in-depth surgeries on him to correct that. He's doing that just fine on his own. Unfortunately, one of the problems that comes in line with these entanglements is these animals have a lot of challenges when it comes to breathing and it can impact your larynx, which is also known as your voice box and how that functionally acts. So you can see that entanglement really embedded in the right side of his neck. So it's quite possible that that anatomically has displaced his larynx into one direction. And then it makes it a little bit more challenging for him to breathe because of that. Um, so we suspect he had pneumonia already. And on the docks when we had been observing him the couple days before we mounted the remote sedation rescue, um, we realized he was having a behavior that we kind of call open mouth breathing or labored breathing. So instead of breathing through their nose or just this calm breathing, you see this increased effort in an open mouth, increased chest excursions and effort into trying to take those breaths. So before Loki even got here, he was having issues breathing that were probably associated with the entanglement and a secondary pneumonia from that entanglement. Um, but since he's been here, it unfortunately hasn't been improving. So we've got him on some medications. Um, couple of different antibiotics. We just started him on one antibiotic. You can see this is him open mouth breathing. We're going to go out to his pen um, and show you guys what that looks like in person, but we don't like to talk too, too much about them or in front of them. We talk about them a lot, but we don't like to talk too much in front of them. So we're going to try not to talk too much while we're out here. So we wanted to show you this video and let you guys see this level of effort that he has to try and breathe. So Loki, or sorry, Bolt, um, <laughs> is definitely not out of the woods right now. We've got to get this pneumonia under control. We have to see if he has any anatomical issues with his larynx um, that would preclude our ability to release him. Um, he needs to be able to hunt and forage and fish on his own. And right now, when we just move him from one pen to another pen, he gets quite winded. Um, and so that means he probably wouldn't be very successful chasing after fish underwater. 
Um, so we've got him on a couple different medications right now, some antibiotics to try and clear up any evidence of pneumonia. We're also going to tr start a treatment on him for something called sarcocystis, which is a protozoa, um, just in case that's affecting his diaphragm, which can affect their ability to breathe. And then he probably will be put under anesthesia for a second time so we can do some additional diagnostics. And those will include full body radiographs focused on his thorax initially to ensure he doesn't have any fractured ribs, anything called a pneumothorax, which means air outside of his lungs, um, or just in general seeing how bad his pneumonia is. Overall, Bolt has been doing pretty well otherwise with us. Dr. Kaylee, do you wanna talk about his eating habits since he's been here? Sure, um, so Bolt has definitely had a great appetite. Um, he does eat um, about 20 to 25 pounds of fish per day. Um, so as you can imagine, that adds up quickly and that's um, why he's had a nice weight gain. So he came in at 255 pounds, like we mentioned, but we actually just um, reweighed him today and he's up to 300, or 303 pounds today. Um, yeah, so his appetite has uh, definitely been great. Um, but um, his activity level, um, his attitude seems good, but like Dr. Demi mentioned, he does get winded fairly easily, so. So, so. if you guys can think of any questions, you guys can start throwing them in the chat and we'll try and answer some questions for you. But first, let's go walk down to Bolt's pen and check him out in person. Thank you all who have joined us so far and have donated to help us support PMMC's fish drive. Pit stop at a recent elephant seal. <laughs> All right, here we are. All right, guys, so you can see little Bolts kind of hanging out in his pool. It's his favorite afternoon activity, second to only eating. Um, so he's um, right now looking like he's chilling out pretty well, but you guys will be able to see once he takes a breath, um, he's probably going to lift his head over the water and open his mouth and you'll see that real deep increased effort of chest excursion. Um, there it is. So that's not a normal breathing pattern for a sea lion. They can do that intermittently on occasion, but it shouldn't be every single breath. Um, so like I said, we are a little bit concerned about what that means. The health of his lungs um, are definitely the number one concern for him. Um, and we're, we're, we've got him on some treatments that will hopefully improve that over time. The fact that he's been gaining weight, he's got a great appetite for us, um, are both really good signs, um, but we need to figure out what's going on with this abnormal breathing. Um, you guys can see his scar on his neck. So the right side of his neck is where that significant defect was, showing a lot of that muscle. That's already healed so well. He's only been here in house with us for 16 days, so a little bit over two weeks. And that massive laceration has healed so, so well already. So we're really excited to see that that's healing well, but we don't love the fact that he's not breathing great. If it is an anatomical issue, so if we do end up putting him under anesthesia and doing an exam of his oral pharynx, his larynx, and kind of just seeing the position, if it does look like it's being displaced laterally from the scar tissue, we could potentially cut open that scar tissue a little bit to loosen up that tension around his neck and it hopes that the larynx will set back into a more normal place. But first, before we do that kind of invasive surgery, we want to rule out the things that we could actually treat medically. So that's why we want to get x-rays of him. Um, we want to treat him for that protozoa that we were talking about. And we want to make sure he gets a good course of antibiotics to make sure um, he is on the mend and we're fixing any pneumonia issues that he has and aren't doing surgery unnecessarily if that's not the primary issue for his breathing problems. So, um, as Krista reads some questions for us. Alexandra, our animal care specialist. You guys should recognize her. She takes care of these animals about 40 to 60 hours a week. Um, she's gonna offer him a little bit of food and we're gonna see Balt's amazing appetite. And as you guys can see while he's eating, right now he's 
taking about four to six breaths a minute, but just the excursion of diving in our pretty shallow pool is enough to get him a bit more winded. So you'll see by the end of his meal, after he kind of chows down these uh, multiple pounds of fish. How many, how many pounds is that, Alexander? About four? Four pounds of fish? Um, he's gonna be a little bit winded after that, and that's why we're concerned about his ability um, to forage on his own. If he's having issues catching fresh frozen fish in a small pool, um, will he be successful if we release him at this point? And the answer is probably not. So we're gonna do our best to help his breathing get a little bit better before we do end up releasing him. But overall, he's making strides in the right direction. And we're pretty proud of his weight gain. I don't know how many of us would be proud of gaining 55 pounds <laughs> in two weeks, but um, we're very supportive of, of Bolt's eating habits. And we're excited that at least his mentation is good enough and his appetite is good enough. So he's not hurting too, too bad. So we'll be happy to answer any questions if you guys have any. Yeah, go ahead and throw some questions in the chat about Bold, about PMMC, and about what we do. Right. Is there a certain type of fish that gill nets are designed for? They catch a variety of fish, um, anywhere ranging from amberjack, um, some kinds of sharks are caught using gill nets. Um, Let's see, what else? There's there's a lot of different fish. Swordfish can be caught by gill nets. Um, so there's there's a number of fisheries that utilize gill nets. The, we're a little bit concerned that these animals may be exposed to gill nets in international waters. Um, in California, there's only a couple of fisheries that allow gill nets um, within federal and state waters. So it's quite possible that these gill nets are being used in international waters, which we actually can't um, put laws uh, in place to not allow their use because we don't have jurisdiction over policies and, and law enforcement in international waters. And that's where it's really important to kind of make your consumer dollar do the talking. So um, one of the things that I use personally is I decrease my seafood in intake. So I try not to eat a ton of seafood. I take advantage of my dad's fishing habits and my friend's husband's fishing habits. So I know that they're responsibly catching fish out there. And then when I do feel like eating fish out in a restaurant, I always check the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch guide. So that's one thing that you can get an app on your phone. It's called Seafood Watch. It's done by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And that's every year they reassess fisheries and the impacts that they have on marine mammals and give you a green light, a yellow light, or a red light on whether or not you should be consuming that type of seafood. Um, the issue with that is sometimes restaurants are unaware of um, how the seafood that they have are caught. So intentionally eating at restaurants that um, kind of support sustainable fisheries is one of the ways that you can start creating a demand for sustainably caught seafood. So don't be shy about asking your server to ask the chef where the fish was captured from whether or not it's sustainable, and especially if they say they have sustainable seafood on their menu, making them accountable for that, asking them why they think it's sustainable um, and which ones are the best ones for you to put your dollar behind. And then that way the fisheries really do want to provide a good product, um, but they also want to provide a product that isn't too expensive. And so that compromise between cost and catch um, is something that fishermen really have to take into consideration. So being willing to pay a little bit more for sustainably caught seafood um, would probably encourage fishermen to deploy the more appropriate um, fishing methods that decrease the risk for our sea lion patients. And indirectly, it doesn't just help our sea lion patients, it helps all marine life ranging from sea turtles to marine, other marine mammals like dolphins and whales. Can you estimate how old Bolt is? Yeah, it's a little bit harder in these males. His teeth are a little bit worn down, but he's quite short and, and not doesn't weigh too much for an adult male. Based off of his behavior and size, my best guess for Bolt would probably be between anywhere to, from eight to 10 years old. Um, so male California sea lions become sexually mature between five and seven years old. 
Um, you can see he's all wet right now, so it's probably a little bit harder to see, but on the top of his head, he's got a little bump, and when he's dry, he gets that really cool blonde mohawk. You might have seen that in some of our Facebook pictures. That's a sexually dimorphic characteristic of male California sea lions. So anytime you see, he's giving us a big old yawn, anytime you see an adult ma or a, a sea lion that's as big as him, they get quite um, thick around the chest and neck compared to the females. We can go visit Electra so you can compare her. We have an adult female in-house as well. Um, and if they have that blonde mohawk, they're probably an adult male sea lion. Um, so I think he's a little bit younger because he's a little bit smaller. It's kind of challenging to make that determination now. For those of you that have been longtime followers of the Pacific Marine Mammal Center, you know from 2013 to 2016, we were in an unusual mortality event of the California sea lion pups right off of our coast. And that was causing a massive amount of malnutrition in these first year pups. So these baby pups were kind of starving to death. And we actually think the lack of nutrients over those four years made that cohort of animals a little bit shorter and a little bit lighter than we would expect um, a sea lion that was provided appropriate nutrition through that early stage of life. Um, so my guess would be he was probably born around 2010, 2011, 2012, and he probably didn't get as, as much nutrients as he needed during his young adolescent time. So he's a little bit shorter than what you would expect an adult male sea lion to be. These guys, especially the bigger, the big boys, if you guys are Dana Point residents, you know Bo, I think they call him. We call him Bubba. Um, but he's a big old sea lion that probably weighs about 800 pounds that hangs out on those docks. So that's how big they can get up to 800 pounds and cute little bolts only pushing a little over 300 right now. So he is still a little bit in poor body condition. He can definitely thicken out and fill out. Um, but uh, based off of how his size, how long he is or how tall he is, I guess, um, he uh, probably couldn't handle 800 pounds on that body. So he's still got some growing to do potentially, but overall he's a little bit small for an adult male sea lion. You wanna go take a look at yeah, let's Electra. Go, let's go check out Electra. I know you guys saw Naja um, on your way through, but if you notice these elephant seals, that's Ace on the left and Gator on the right, um, are much chunkier than little Naja. Um, so these guys are about ready to go back to their ocean home. These three troublemakers are ready to go. So these guys are getting released in the next week or two. And as you guys know from our videos, these guys get released by boat. Um, so we release them off a boat because at this life stage, they should be out in the ocean, not near the beaches, which is a little bit different than our harbor seals and sea lion. Um, is there a reason Bolt is in a pen by himself? Does he need to be isolated for health reasons? No, the adult males, um, first of all, we only have four sea lions in house and they all have their preferences of how social they wanna be. Our two pup sea lions much prefer to be by themselves. They're not interested in hanging out with Bolt, unfortunately. Um, so this is Miss Haggis you see over here. If you guys have been paying attention to our Facebook, you know Miss Haggis actually has a hook in her neck. She's got an eye injury and she presented very malnourished. She's filling out quite nicely, but she's a little bit weird to be honest with you. Her behavior socially is kind of abnormal and it makes the other sea lions not want to hang out with her too much. So we slowly try and get her more habituated to other sea lions um, by interacting with Gouda, one of our other sea lions that is having eye issues currently that's in house. Um, but we don't want to stress them out too much when they're healing as well. So we don't make them, if they don't want to hang out with each other, we don't make them. With Bolt and Electra, we don't want to mix them right now because it's still around breeding season and we definitely don't want them to be making babies while they're here. Um, we need them to focus on healing. So this is Miss Electra. You can see she's an adult female California sea lion. She weighs a whopping 200 pounds, which is quite hefty for an adult California sea lion female. Um, and she presented for acute domoic acid intoxication. So for our Dana Point followers, once again, she presented on Strands Beach. She initially stranded on Table Rock Beach um, and then was found the next day um, on Strands. And she had some abnormal behavior, but because she's in good body condition, it was a little bit hard to tell um, whether or not she needed to be rescued or not. Um, so actually, Dr. Kaylee went out on her rescue. It was her first beach sedation. So I'll let her talk a little bit about how exciting that was. <laughs> Sure. So um, we initially went out on a Friday morning um, to kind of assess her, see how she was doing. Um, she was 
lane, normally seemingly resting, um, but there was already a large crowd of people around her and she didn't seem bothered by them, which is abnormal. Um, they should typically want to either leave the area if there is a large crowd of people um, or should at least be paying attention to them. And she just kind of um, was resting and didn't seem bothered by the people. So we initially um, did try to, we attempted to put a net on her and she immediately um, made a beeline for the ocean. Um, and so we did give her a chance, took the nets off, and you know, if she was healthy enough to make it to the ocean, we were gonna give her a chance and monitor her. Um, but at that point, she did have a seizure um, and where she had full body convulsions. And so at that point, it was very clear to us that she did need to be rescued. And um, so our biggest um, concern for her is that she had domoic acid intoxicosis. Um, and so with those animals, um, it can be quite tricky to uh, sort of evaluate or tease out the behavior and see if it's ab completely abnormal um, or not. But whenever they do have those, the seizure activity, it's fairly clear to us at that point. Um, so in the, her post-ictal stage or after her seizure, um, she was very disoriented and um, was basically non-visual. So at that point, we did um, administer an intramuscular sedation um, just to help calm her and provide a less stressful transport to the center here. Um, and when she did come in, um, she again was non-visual. She is, you know, a little bit, a bit stressed. Um, so we did administer uh, additional medication, so anticonvulsants. Um, to help kind of quiet her brain and um, allow her to rest calmly. And then the, the, one of the most important treatments for demoic acid intoxication intoxicosis is uh, fluid administration to help flush out that toxin. Um, so just a quick note about demoic acid. So it is um, considered a harmful algal bloom um, or a biotoxin. Um, amnesic fish poisoning um, is a, another name for it. And so this does affect our sea lions as well as humans. Um, so this is something that basically our kind of take home point for it is the this happens whenever there is a lot of like fertilizer um, in the soil and that does the runoff uh, leads to the ocean and then can cause these harmful algal blooms. Um, so we do encourage uh, people to reduce the use of fertilizer um, and uh, that will help reduce the toxin load in the ocean. Um, so she is off of her phenobarbital of anticonvulsant medication and so we're monitoring her now to make sure she does not have any further seizure activity um, but overall she's doing fairly well and we're um, she still of course has a guarded prognosis while we monitor her throughout this time but um, really happy with her, her rehab yeah she's she's been eating well for us we just stopped her phenobarb on Monday so that's her anti-seizure medication um, and we will be monitoring her over the next week um, if she does have a seizure since we discontinued her medication, that would actually mean instead of being what we call an acute domoic acid intoxication, that she's a chronic domoic acid intoxication. So for those of you that remember Howler that was with us, that was an adult male sea lion that we had a few weeks ago, um, who was also an acute domoic acid intoxication. And um, he was treated and we pulled him off his meds and after a week of no seizures off of his meds, he was good to go and got released. And if you guys saw that video of his cool <laughs> stroll down to the ocean, it was pretty adorable to see. Um, we're really hopeful because she's in good body condition that she's an acute demoic acid case. Usually when they're chronic demoic acids, it affects a portion of your brain that, that impacts your ability to remember where food is in space and time. So um, usually if they're chronic demoic acid animals, they come in much skinnier than she does, she is. Um, that's a tricky part with demoic acid and why we always have to send teams out to actually assess animals, even if they're in good body condition, because if somebody just sent us a picture of her on the beach, we would think she looks like she's not skinny, overall she looks normal, um, but her behavior is what was abnormal and that's hard to translate over pictures. So we do send out teams to assess animals when we're really concerned if there's a demoic acid bloom happening to make sure that they don't need our help and she actually did. 
So we're happy to have her back. Um, the, we gave her some steroids to decrease the inflammation in her brain as well. And as you guys can see, when I walk by her kennel or her pen, um, she'll track me. So that's one way we can tell that they're visual. She's looking at me, right? Before, when we were walking by her, she would have no idea. And she would be very startled if you approached her or touched her. And that's because she was non-visual. So although these animals can't read an eye chart for us, we are able to assess their visibility by throwing fish or walking by their pen and seeing if they can track items. So we're really happy that her vision has come back. If you guys remember, Howler couldn't see either after his seizures. So it's a common sequelae or outcome secondary to seizures in pinheads, but also in people. Um, so we're really happy with her progress. She's a little bit quiet right now, which we don't love, but the sedative or the um, anti-seizure medication that she got can cause sedation. And it takes about 72 hours for that seizure medication to get moved out of their bloodstream. So she was taken off of her medications on Monday. What is today? Tuesday? <laughs> so she's probably a little sedate still from her seizure meds. That side effect is actually a benefit that we take advantage of. So we put them on phenobarbital, which is her anti-seizure med for a week, but the first three days of their treatment, they also get something called lorazepam. So that's in the family of drugs that um, Valium is in or diazepam, and that's also an anti-convulsant, but it causes sedation as well. So by giving her two sedative anti-convulsant medications, it makes her very, very sleepy, which makes it much safer for our animal care team to go in there and administer her the subcutaneous fluids that she really needs in order to flush that toxin out of her system. So although the anti-seizure meds are great to try and prevent seizures, they're also really helpful in our treatment plans for her to make it both safer and less stressful for her and make it safer for our crew and then increase her outcome because we're able to safely get those sub fluids in her. And one of the other things that, you know, I love our animal care volunteers and staff so much, they definitely um, work really hard for these animals. She was a little bit less sedated than a lot of our sea lions on those meds. She's kind of a heavyweight when it comes to her medications. She can handle them quite well. So <laughs> instead of giving her subcutaneous fluids for a whole week, we started doing what we call hydrating her fish. So that's actually us having the volunteers and our staff draw Pedialyte and injecting it into every single fish that she eats. So she eats <laughs> about 20 pounds of fish a day too. And so that's them injecting hundreds and hundreds of fish with Pedialyte a day to kind of increase her fluid intake to help flush out that toxin, which is really her primary treatment that she needs while she's here. So we're stoked that she's doing really well. Um, we're excited to see her kind of come off her drugs and see how she does when she doesn't have those sedatives on board. And we're really optimistic that she won't have any seizures this week and we'll send her to her ocean home by the end of next week. So fingers crossed for her. <laughs> Keep an eye out for a post of her release. I'm sure she'll be a popular one. I have a feeling she'll be really excited to get back into the ocean. <laughs> Well, Dr. Deming, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for taking the time to do this live with us today. Thank you all for joining us and for all of your donations. We are so very appreciative. For anyone who's local or visiting the area, you're more than welcome to come visit our patients in our visitor yard. Um, but yeah, thank you so much and we'll see you next time. Bye guys. Bye.